to church today. They just don't know what they're missing, do they? Now, now, before I get started, I do have to let you know that Superman has x-ray vision, but he doesn't have 20-20 vision. Oh and Clark Kent keeps taking my glasses, so I just don't know what to do. But I do want to welcome you to the Odyssey Church this morning as we finish up this series on the Holy Spirit. But before we get started, I do want to say Happy Father's Day to all of you that are here, all of you that are fathers. And I want to just say Happy Father's Day, of course, to my own father. Here's a family picture of us. Um, Jarrell. All right, she... As, as you notice, <laughs> doesn't my dad look a lot like Marlon Brando if you go back one screen? But that's a family picture just before they sent me into this little tiny capsule and blasted me off in the street. But really, I'm just kidding. You know that. This is a picture of my dad. This is a picture of my hero, my superhero, when I was growing up particularly. Now, a superhero is somebody who's defined as somebody who has superpowers, somebody who uses those powers, either a woman or a man, to do good. And I'm telling you, when I was a kid, I thought my dad was the greatest superhero there was. I mean, my dad was bigger than me. My dad was smarter than me. My dad did good things. He was my superhero. Now, as I grew older, I began to understand that my dad did have some human flaws, and my dad didn't have these superpowers that I thought that he might have, but he was still my hero, and he's still my hero. My dad died of cancer back in 2003. It seems like yesterday some days, and other days uh, it seems like it was yesterday. Now, someone who did have superpowers was Superman, right? You read him in the comics, you saw him growing up, he was faster than a speeding board, he was more powerful than a locomotive, he was able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Remember the saying, look up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman! So, you know, one of my heroes growing up was Superman, but I, I, may, I might like Superman just a little bit too much. <laughs> but have you recently noticed the number the number of movies that are coming out about comic heroes that yeah. we see in the comic books and we saw on TV when we're going I mean, you got Thor, you got Iron Man, you got Captain America, you got the Fantastic Four, you got the Avengers, you got Ant Man. I'm like, Ant Man? I watched the movie. It was actually pretty good. Uh, Superman, Batman versus Superman, and I could go on and on. In fact, I was looking at a list of movies coming out between now and 2020, and it's amazing at the number of superhero movies that are coming out. And I think part of this, I think part of the reason for this is, you know, we have this infatuation with these movies is because we, we sort of all wish, you know, at least a little bit deep down, that maybe we have some kind of this super duper special power, you know? We want to save the day. We want to defeat dark forces. We want to take care of those evil enemies. You know, Douglas Adams, uh, Douglas Adams wrote a book uh, called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the uh, Universe. And I don't know if any of you read it. it. I mean, he has a wonderful sense of humor. Um, I read the fourth book in the, uh, in the trilogy, if that makes any sense to anybody, okay? Trilogy means three, he wrote four. Um, but the first one is called The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, and it was one of my favorite books when I was 16 or 17 years old. And it makes this claim. It says, the knack of flying is simply learning how to throw yourself at the ground and miss. <laughs> uh. Now, here's the thing. He tells us in his book, he says, pick a really nice day, and you just try it. And he says, the first part of flying is really, really simple. You just throw yourself at the ground, and you miss the ground. All it requires is simply the ability to throw yourself forward with all your weight and all your might and all your willingness, and not to mind that it's going to hurt. That is, if you fail to miss the ground. Then Douglas Adams says, most people fail to miss the ground. Mm -hmm. Most people fail to miss the ground, and if they're really doing it properly, in all likelihood, 
likelihood they're going to fail and they're going to miss it fairly hard. So see, when I was little, I wanted to fly. There was just a problem. I kept failing to miss the ground. <laughs> no matter how many times I tried, I just couldn't seem to miss the ground. Even in my Superman costume, no matter how high I jumped on my bed, no matter how many times I would jump high with all my might, I failed to miss the ground. I threw myself forward with everything I had and all my weight. And since I was really trying to do it properly, as he said in the book, I'd come back and hit the earth, and I'd hit it fairly hard. And he was right. It hurt. And sometimes the furniture wouldn't even survive. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, what it seems is God did not design mankind to fly, did he? But here's the fact. If I get in the airplane, and the airplane takes off, and the airplane is flying, guess what? You're flying. I'm flying, right? I'm now in the airplane, the airplane is flying, and I'm flying. Now, then I, God may not have designed us to fly, but he did design us to have a kind of superpower. We fail to miss that in the church so often. If you're a Christian, if you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and made him Lord over your life, you are a superhero with superpowers. You're not a normal human being. You're a superhuman with supernatural powers. And the Bible tells us this over and over and over again, and yet, most of the time, we simply miss it. Amen. When we put our faith and we put our trust in Jesus Christ, when we confess Jesus with our mouths, believe the gospel, and we ask Jesus into our hearts and make him Lord over our lives, Jesus himself, and this is recorded in history by a man that walked with Jesus, not only walked with Jesus, he had 12 apostles, and of the 12 apostles, he had what he called his inner three. And one of those men was John. And John writes in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 15 and 17, or 15 through 17, he says, if you love me, now that's important, because he said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. Because we have these powers, and in order to have these powers, we need to keep the commands of Jesus, as you're going to see later in this message. He said, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you an advocate to help you and to be with you, not for a little while, not for some time, but forever. Amen. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him, mm -hmm. uh -huh. for he lives with you and will be in you. And then Luke. The physician, in his second letter, what we call the book of Acts, he says, you, you mean me, you, everybody, that accepts Jesus Christ will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. In other words, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, not only are we in Jesus Christ, but the Holy Spirit resides in us, and the Holy Spirit gives us the power of God. And not just any kind of superhuman power. This is a supernatural power of God himself. How much power do we get? Well, listen to the kind of powers which were available to the apostles when Pente on the day of Pentecost and afterwards, in, in what we call the book of Acts. Listen to the kind of power they had, and according to Paul, we have the same power. Paul writes to these Christians in Rome, and he says, You are controlled by the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God living from the dead, lives in you. <laughs> now that's an awesome amount of power. The same Spirit living in each believer is the very same Spirit that had the power to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. That is a lot of power each one of us have access to. Amen. We just don't all plug into it, do we? Let me tell you some of the things the disciples of Jesus were able to do after they received the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5, Peter is so filled so filled with the Holy Spirit. Even his shadow, even his shadow has the power to heal. 
Sick people were brought out in the streets and mats and beds, and Peter would walk by, and even if his shadow touched them, they were healed. I mean, you think about this, it makes that palm, uh, whatever his name is, palm, 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 satani, palm satani Phil, right? Oh. You come out and see his shadow, his shadow don't mean nothing to Peter's shadow. Palm satani Phil gets it wrong most of the time. Peter's shadow heal people. Acts chapter 8, Phil to Ethiopia. God says, Philip, I want you to go down this street. Philip's obedient. See, obedience is key. Philip goes down this street, and when he does, he finds this man. He's reading the scripture. Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? The man says, how can anybody understand this unless somebody explains it to him? So Philip sits down and begins to explain to him about Jesus Christ. This man hears the good news about Jesus Christ, and he says, Philip, will you baptize me? So they ride down the road. They see some more. Philip baptized him, and then something just like a Star Trek happens. Hmm. Philip's transported. He's gone. He disappears. And the word says that the man, the Holy Spirit, snatches up Philip. He's transferred to something like that. And this man who got baptized never sees Philip again. Man, it's so weird, right? Then in Acts chapter 9, Peter hears a man that, that, that's been paralyzed for eight years. But well, Peter's not done. The Holy Spirit gives him the power to raise a girl named Tabitha from the dead. She's dead, and Peter raises her up. Now, Tabitha also went by the name Dorcas, but, it, but I'm pretty sure she preferred Tabitha. I'm not, I'm not real sure about that. But, you know, who wants to be called Dorcas, right? In Acts chapter 20, now I really like this account, because some people, and I know it's not anybody in here, okay, some people feel I speak too long, okay? I just want you to know that. But here's the Apostle Paul. John, quit smiling. And here's the Apostle Paul. <laughs> You're not alone, John. And listen to this. The Apostle Paul has been preaching all day long. I mean, this ain't no hour sermon. He's been preaching all day long. You know what time it is now? He's still preaching. He ain't caught a breath yet. It is now midnight. And it is a boy. And this young man by the name of Eutychus, he's sitting in the windowsill and Paul's preaching. And he's like, man, I've been here for 12 hours. This is getting a little time. It's starting to get a little hot in here. And he falls fast asleep. Now, the thing is, this windowsill was on the third floor. And the scripture says he fell out the window to his death. And Paul sees this. He gets up. He walks down three steps of death, or three steps, or three stories down the steps. He bends over the boy and says, get up! Boy rises from the dead. Paul and Eutychus, they walk back up to three flights of stairs. Paul serves communion to Eutychus and everybody else. And then he preaches all the way to dawn. 24-hour service. How do you all like to sit through that? I know it might feel like it sometimes, but I don't speak for 24 hours, okay? Now, here's the moral of that story. Don't fall asleep while I'm preaching, because if you fall over dead, I probably can't raise you from the dead, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, in addition, there's other accounts of the Holy Spirit giving you these disciples these superpowers, these supernatural powers. I mean, they heal the blind, they heal the lame, they heal the possessed, and cast out demons. There were these amazing jailbreaks. I mean, the Apostle Paul, he stranded on an island after a, a shipwreck, and he heals a man of severe diarrhea. So if, if y'all don't read the Bible, you don't think you get excited, don't try reading it sometime. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, I know that some of this is hard to believe. People being raised from the dead. Paul uh, uh, just reaching over a man. Says that Paul got built by a venomous snake. And everybody watched for him to die. And Paul said, I ain't dying, I ain't doing nothing. I'm just going to sit here by the fire. People who were lame began to walk. I know all that sort of seems strange. What we have to remember is this book was written <coughs> by a physician. His name was Luke. And Luke tells us that I carefully investigated it. I interviewed the witnesses. And I only wrote down what I could prove. That, that these are historical accounts that a doctor, a physician, who knew dead people, who knew people and what would happen in their illnesses and how they could be cured. He said these are impossibilities. 
And we translate this word miracle, but it actually in the scriptures, it's, it's actually a couple of words. One is signs and one is wonders. And it's all a point to a living God who has power that he's willing to bestow upon us. But here's what I believe the greatest power of all. We love to see the miracles. We love to see the healings. But I believe the greatest power the Holy Spirit gives us is this. The Holy Spirit gives us a power to live a Christ-like life. Okay? The good news is God gives us His grace. He gives us His mercy. He gives us His power to do what we can't do on our own. And that is to live in the love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. To pick up our cross daily and walk and live the Christian life. And for those of you that have tried to do this, you know how difficult it is, how impossible it is to do it in your own power. The Holy Spirit is God's presence in our lives. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to do what we can't do on our own. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to love and continue to grow and mature and become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. We all have a responsibility. We have to decide. We have to decide to step out and follow Jesus. Nobody can do it for you. Your mom can't decide for you for you to follow Jesus. Your dad can't do it. Your best friend can't do it. Your children can't do it. Your boss can't do it. You have to decide whether you are going to step out on faith and trust Jesus to do what you cannot do on your own. But you don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to to do this in your own power. The Holy Spirit gives us the power so that we can live out the Christian life. He gives us the power to do what we cannot do on our own. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn it into the uh, book of Ephesians. Now, the book of Ephesians is a small book. It's only six chapters, and we're going to be looking at chapter six. And sometimes the easiest way to find a small book of the Bible is to find a large book of the Bible. So go to 1st and 2nd Corinthians, which is right after the book of Romans. Take a right to Galatians, and then the very next book is the book of Ephesians. And if you don't have a Bible, again, I let everybody know that there's Bibles up here. They're, they're free. They're for you. Uh, take them with you. Bring them back every Sunday. Because this is what we believe here at the Odyssey Church, is that we want everybody that we can put the hand of God's Word into, into their hands, because we know that Jesus Christ, the Word of God, has a transforming power, and this transforming power of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, can help you live life and live it more abundantly. Amen. So we give it out for free. And you know what? God has returned those blessings time and time and time again. So as you turn into Ephesians chapter 6, I want you to think about some of these heroes that we read about in the comic books and in the cartoons. And one thing that you're going to notice is most of them were not born with their power, right? Now, you know, it's famous, so of course there's some, there's some, you know, some exceptions. But most of them don't and aren't born with the power that themselves. They receive the power from somebody or something else. I mean, Spider-Man got bit by a radioactive spider, right? The Hulk was a scientist by the name of Bruce Banner who came into contact with gamma radiation. Iron Man receives his power from the computerized armor suit. Even Superman was just a normal man on his planet. But when he came to Earth, he received his powers from the Yellow Star. Now, if you don't know what the Yellow Star is, we call it the Sun. Okay? <laughs> just like these fictional superheroes, None of us are born with the power, the real power, the power that's clearly defined in Scripture. We aren't born with the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to read it or receive it from somebody else. Not something else, but somebody else. Amen. Now, here's the really cool part. This is what I mean. When we receive this Holy Spirit and His power, God gives us a superhuman a superhero outfit to wear. 
Now, it doesn't look like this. I just want you to know. <laughs> That's what I'm going to be. Amen, brother. <laughs> but I bet you didn't know that, did you? You know, that's what I'm going to be talking about this morning. The power we see from the Holy Spirit and the superhero outfit that God gives us. And I'm going to begin to read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. A final word. Now, the Apostle Paul's been writing this letter, and he, he's been writing it to the people in Ephesus, to the Ephesians. Hence the name the Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. But what we know about Scripture is that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. So not only was it written to the people of Ephesians, it's written to everybody who's a believer in Jesus Christ. And there's an overall theme to the book of Ephesians. Originally it was a letter that Paul sent there. So we know it's written to them and to us. And the overall theme is that we can know what God's intention is for, for his people. And then he gives us insight to the nature of what Jesus wants his church to actually look like. So this is a, a great book to study if you want to know a couple of things. For example, if you've ever asked yourself, you know, why am I here? Why did God place me on this earth? You might want to read the entire book of Ephesians. It's only six chapters long. But to answer the question why we're here, it's probably going to surprise you because it's not what you're going to hear on daytime TV. It's not what you're going to hear on some of the talk shows. It's not what you're going to hear on, on, on the History Channel. It has to do with eternity. It has to do with making peace with your Creator. It has to do with understanding. If you believe in Jesus Christ, it has to do with understanding what your new identity is in Jesus Christ. Now, if any of you think that that's some of the things you might want to know, spend about a half hour reading this great letter written by Paul. And, and if you have some questions, call me on the phone. I may not have all the answers, but I have access to a lot of pastors and, I, and a lot of literature and a lot of training. I, I'll find the answer for you. The Holy Spirit will give them the answer. But Paul, Paul's been writing this letter. And he said, okay, this is uh, your new identity in Christ. And this is what I desire for my people. And this is how my church is wrapping up. Or this is how my church is supposed to look. And he's beginning to wrap things up. So he says a final word. Be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. See, Paul's telling us you cannot do this on your own. I can't do it on my own and you can't do it on our own. We can't make peace with God on our own. We can't have eternity with God on our own. We can't be the church that God wants us to be on our own, we have to have his superpower to do these super things. We have to apply ourselves to the work and the duty of the Christian and his superpower is what gives us the power that we have. And we aren't born with this power. We receive it from God. See, it's not our power. He says his mighty power, meaning God's mighty power. It is God's power. And once we receive His power, He also gives us our superhero outfit. And here it is. Put on all of God's armor. Amen. Yes. See, even our superhero suit does not belong to us. Our superhero suit belongs to God. It is His armor. <coughs> it's God's suit. There's a sister verse in, in one of Paul's other letters. It's what we now call the book of Romans. And in Romans 13, 14, it says, Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I love that verse. I try to remember it as often as possible. And sometimes, because I'm a visual person, I'll wake up in the morning and say, I want to clothe myself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll pretend like I'm putting on his clothes. Love that verse. Clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the armor of God. God gives us our superhero suit, but we have to do something, don't we? We have to put it on. What good is a present if you never open it? What good is a suit if you never put it on? And Paul doesn't leave us to wonder why we should put it on. He said, put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. But we're not fighting against flesh and blood and the enemies. 
but against the evil wars and authorities of an unseen world. Against mighty powers in this dark world. Against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, we have to have, we need to have, we need to put on God's armor, God's superhero suit, because we need God's power. Because we're taking a stand against the greatest adversary the world has ever seen, the devil himself. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. You don't need a superhero suit. You don't need a lot of armor to fight against flesh and blood. You don't need God's suit of armor to battle the natural, but our fight isn't in the natural. Our fight is against the supernatural. Our fight is against the evil rulers and the authorities of an unseen world, against the mighty powers of the dark and the evil world and the devil and his spirits. I was talking to my wife yesterday, and the last 60 days of our lives have been very difficult. I mean, if you... Uh, just name an area of life where it could possibly go wrong. It, it has gone wrong. And I'm talking to her and I'm studying this message. It's, it's funny how God makes me live out some of my own messages. And I say funny very sarcastically, okay? But we're talking. And Janet says, not everything is spiritual. And you know what? According to Scripture, it is. It may not manifest itself in the supernatural. It may manifest your, itself against somebody who says something evil against you. It may manifest itself from you in your job. It may manifest just itself in a car accident. It can manifest itself in your health. But according to Scripture, we don't fight flesh and blood. We fight our own flesh and blood sometimes. But our enemy is a supernatural enemy. And even when we fight our own flesh and blood, it's because there's a devil. There's an authority. There is an evil ruler. There is a spirit that's whispering in your ear and telling you to do that. When we're fighting the devil himself, when we're fighting evil rulers and spirits and you're in a dark place and you're in a dark world and you're fighting an enemy that you can't even see, you better not be in your own power and you better not be in your own suit and tie. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> If you're going to hold up, if you're going to stand firm, if you're going to take a stand, you better have somebody else's power, and you better have somebody else's armor, and that somebody better be stronger than your enemy. You better put on the clothes of Jesus Christ and God's suit of armor and have His power and His <coughs> Holy Spirit because we have a promise of God that when we do this, the Apostle John tells us if you belong to God, you have already won the victory because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. You can't fight a supernatural battle with natural powers. You need supernatural powers to fight a supernatural power. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. See, we need to put on the entire superhero suit. We need to put on the entire armor of God, every piece of his armor, so we can stand the ground and stand firm. And some people might ask, well, why do we have to stand firm? I mean, we got Jesus. Why don't we just advance? Why don't we just take the hill? Well, the answer is simple. We don't have to. The battle's already been won. Jesus has fought and died and rose again to prove the devil and the wars of the dark world and the evil spirits have already been defeated. We do not have to fight the battle. We do not have to take the hill. It's already been done. All we have to do is stand firm. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thank God He gives us the victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has already done the work have the Holy Spirit in you, you can't be defeated by the devil. You can't be defeated by his wars. You can't be defeated by his evil spirit. They can harass you. They can come against you. They can frustrate you. But they cannot defeat you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So. The spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Amen. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body of God's armor's righteousness. Amen. Amen. Now 
this is what Paul is doing. Paul's taking an illustration that everybody in this point of history would understand. They'd be familiar with the armor of a Roman soldier. Now, the interesting thing about this is Paul takes each piece of armor in the same order that the Roman soldier would put it on. First, the soldier would put on his belt because that's what held his body armor together. So what's Paul talking about? What is this belt of truth and the body armor of righteousness? One of the things I've learned about Scripture is that if we let God interpret God, if we let Scripture interpret Scripture, we don't have to worry about man's interpretation, do we? The prophet Isaiah writes in his book, the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verse 5. Now he's prophesying about Jesus. He says, he will wear his righteousness like a belt and his truth like an undergarment. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17, the prophet writes, he has put his righteousness as his body armor and placed the helmet of salvation on his head. You know what that means? That means we are all wrapped up and tied together with Jesus Christ. Amen. And Jesus Christ is God's righteousness. He is the one who is the truth in life. He is the one that holds us together. And we can't be defeated because the victory's already won. We're wearing Jesus. We're clothed in the clothes of Jesus Christ. He is our armor. All we have to do is stand firm. For shoes put on a piece that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. Now, a Roman soldier's shoes, actually they were sandals, had a special name. They were called caligae. And this is what a caligae looked like. And if you look at the caligae, they had metal studs in them. What were the metal studs for? For gripping, so that they could stand firm. It's to help the soldier stand firm in battle. And I want you to notice this. Look at what it says. It doesn't say, go and get prepared. It doesn't say, be prepared. Because that would mean it's the process of getting a thing ready. Instead, Paul says, you will be fully prepared. I don't have to get prepared because I'm already fully prepared. Fully prepared means I have the state of mind. A man or woman has a state of mind of that we are already prepared. You don't have to get prepared because you're already prepared because you have on the clothes of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the full armor of God and we're clothed in Him and the Holy Spirit is your superpower. Your condition of being ready comes from the good news of Jesus Christ. Now some people interpret this and say, Happy are the feet of those who bring the good news. But that doesn't fit into this illustration. What I believe that Paul is talking about it is just a little bit different than that. See, the condition of being ready comes from the good news of Jesus Christ. You are fully prepared because of the good news of Jesus Christ. And you don't have to worry... Because you put the gospel, because you have the gospel of peace. You don't have to worry. Paul's stating the result of the thing that's in question. When, let, me, let me ask you. When you, know, when you know for a fact that you're clothed in Jesus Christ and that you have his armor on and that he is your armor and that you have the power of God, can you have anything but peace? <laughs> wow, Nothing can defeat you. In addition to all these things, hold up your shield of faith and stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet. Remember Isaiah 59, 17? He put on righteousness as his body armor and placed the helmet of salvation on his head. Jesus Christ is our salvation. Jesus Christ is the helmet of salvation. God <coughs> interprets God. Put on salvation as your helmet and take your sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And now you know why some people call their Bibles a sword. Paul says it's a sharper than a two-edged sword. Now this is what I understand, and I was not able to verify this, but I heard it from a very educated man, so I believe it to be true. 
A Roman soldier, when he was getting ready to go in battle, he sharpened his sword. And the test as to whether his sword was sharp enough is he would throw up a piece of silk and hold his sword like that, and just the weight of the silk would cut it in half. That's pretty sharp. Mm -hmm. If it didn't cut it in half, he had to go back and sharpen it again. And Paul says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. That's why we have these sword drills. That's why some people call their Bible their sword. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And there were two kinds of shields that were used by the Roman. And you've probably seen both in movies. One was the shield that he held on his forearm. That shield was offensive and defensive. He could swing his arm in battle. He could use it for battle. He could protect himself. But there was another sword. The other sword stood over four foot tall, was over two foot wide, and they would plant it in the dirt and they would hide behind it. You ever seen the movie 300? Mm -hmm. You would see that kind of, of shield. A lot of times the enemy would get the tips of their arrow in tar and they would shoot flaming arrows, fiery darts. They would put poison tips on their uh, arrows and on their spears. And by planting that in the ground and standing behind it, they had their whole front covered and they were protected from these far fiery arrows. So this is what Paul is talking about. The Greek makes it clear that Paul's not talking about this little shield. He's talking about the bigger shield, the larger shield. Sometimes we say, what are these fiery darts? What, what, what exactly is Paul saying? Well, fiery darts can be a lot of things in our life. Our fiery darts, for, for me, at one time it was alcohol. I thank God he delivered me from that. Fiery dart can be our appetite. I'm working on that one. <laughs> fiery dart can be our passions, our earthly desires, our lusts, our addictions, and so many other things. And these fiery darts which can strike at our animal instincts, our animal natures of ours, can set them aflame. Of course, there are more fiery, fiery darts than we could ever mention now. There, there are plenty of other darts that threaten us. Sometimes it's our own wishes that threaten us, right? One of the sayings is, God, <laughs> sometimes give us our desires, and it punishes us. Sometimes it's our anxiety. Sometimes it's our depression. There are weaknesses of all sorts that once touched with that devil's dark, they will begin to burn. And we all know this, don't we? But the question is, do we put on the full armor of God? Do we use God's Spirit to protect us from these things? Because all of these things, they war against our soul, and we have to stand firm. We have to put on our helmet of salvation. We have to dig deep our shield of faith Stand firm with our sword of the Spirit in our Bibles. Because only a touch of fire can cause us to lose footing and crumble into our carnal desires. And we all know this is true. You know, I, I got a man in my life that I love very much. He's an alcoholic. He stayed clean for 20 years. He was about to get married. Him and his wife decided that they were getting ready again to be okay to have a drink. And he's in the throes of alcohol right now that he's about to lose everything he's got. Just one teeny fiery dart, and he's back exactly where he was and even worse. We all probably know somebody that has done that. For some of us, maybe we know them so well that when we look in the mirror, they look back at us. Here's what I believe that Paul is saying. Paul's warning us about the kryptonite of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 4 of this same book, the book of Ephesians, Paul writes this. He said, if you're a thief, sometimes we read the Bible and it's hard to interpret. This is, this is pretty straightforward. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good work and give generously to those in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow, do not bring grief to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. When we grieve the Holy Spirit, it's kryptonite. Just like kryptonite to Superman. 
that weakens not the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit in us. Paul goes on to say, remember he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you'll be saved on the day of redemption. He says, but what you need to do is get rid of all your bitterness, all your rage, all your anger, all your harsh words, all your slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. All those fiery darts in your life you need to get rid of. He says, instead, be kind to each other. Be tender-hearted. Be forgiving to one another. And this is the one that digs deep to me. Because I, I, I know how little I deserve. He says, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Hallelujah. Mm. See, sometimes it's hard to forgive those that have hurt us. But when you realize through your life how many times you have hurt the living God, your Creator, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, Ooh. Truly, I know it's hard. We're human. But truly, we ought to be able to forgive anything any person does to us. First Corinthians <laughs> chapter 5, Paul tells us in full detail as to why we should do this. And depending on your translation, this is what I'll say. Paul says, do not quench. Do not stifle. Do not extinguish. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Sin in to the Holy Spirit is what kryptonite is to Superman. It weakens the Holy Spirit's effectiveness in this. And I have to warn you, do not misinterpret what I'm saying. The Holy Spirit is not weakened, but His effectiveness in our lives, His power in our lives, is weakened. The resources of the Holy Spirit are boundless and unlimited. God gives us His Spirit without measure. Yet we are the ones who weaken His Spirit and His power through yielding to our negative thoughts, <coughs> our feelings of fear, our rebellion. And when we do, we quench, we extension, we stifle, we put out the Spirit's fire and the Spirit's power. God's acceptance of each one of you and of me is complete and unconditional. You need to know that. Amen. Amen. But that does not mean he overlooks sin. That's right. That's right. It simply means that you are his creation and he's willing to go any length he needs to go to to save you and mold you into the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Sin of any kind, <coughs> sin of any kind limits the power we receive from the Holy Spirit. So sometimes, sometimes, God has to empty us of ourselves so that he can fill us with himself. Mm -hmm. And when God begins to empty us of ourselves, the process can become very painful. <clears throat> but here's the good news of the gospel. God is right there to help every single one of you. We are not left on our own. Romans 8.26 gives us this promise. The Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. One of the Holy Spirit's role is to intercede on our behalf. Romans 8, 26 goes on to say, And the Holy Spirit helps us in the weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us. God Himself, in the form of the Holy Spirit, actually comes in, intercedes for us, and prays for us. Now, how amazing is that? But fortunately, for me and you, there is an antidote to the kryptonite of sin. We've talked about it for the last couple of weeks. And some of you are going to say, why would Rob keep telling us the same thing over and over? Why would he speak about this for three weeks? Well, there's two reasons. The first reason is that we remember what we repeat. Repetition simply help us remember. That's right. And here's the second reason. Because I know a lot of you haven't done it yet. Simple as that. What's the antidote? How do we live this life God desires us to live so we can have the full power of the Holy Spirit? Here it comes. Keep your snout to the spout where Jesus comes out. <laughs> Let me tell you this. A life that is filled and controlled has superpower of the Holy Spirit if it's a life of devotion, adoration, examination, meditation, illumination, application, and association. All right, well. 
Keep your snap to the spot where Jesus comes out in prayer and worship. Have a life of devotion and adoration. Charles Stanley makes this claim. He said, God desires our, our fellowship. He desires our friendship and find joy in our coming to Him. Even if we come to Him in desperation, God is blessed by our devotion. See, I think, I mean, you're all smart people. I, I think you recognize the only way to know God's plan for your life is to know God Himself. That's right. That's right. The Holy Spirit is an agent of communication. And it's through Him. God provides us wisdom and knowledge for every situation we may ever face. <clears throat> Luke tells us in the book of Acts, after this prayer, the meeting place shook violently. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they preached the Word of God with great boldness. See, there's a connection. There's a connection between having the power of the Holy Spirit in communication with God. Just as there's a connection to this superpower, the Holy Spirit, when we worship God the Father. Worship draws us nearer to God and gives Him the reverence that is His due. Psalm 19.2 says, Honor the Lord with the glory of His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. The psalmist writes in 5-7, Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship your, your temple with the deepest awe. 95 6 says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Psalm 102, Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him, singing with joy. And there are so many verses, so many verses in the Holy Scriptures which tell us the benefit of worship our Lord. Keep your snout to the spout where Jesus come out in the study of God's Word. This is examination, meditation, and illumination. Psalm 19 says, God's Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, After we have received God's Spirit, not the world's Spirit, so that we can know the wonderful things that God has freely given us. Psalm 19, 14 says, May the words of my meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. By studying God's Word, by meditating on it, by examination of our hearts, God's Word is a lamp to guide our feet. It lights up the paths in front of us. We read God's Word so the Holy Spirit can reveal to us the wonderful things that God has freely given us. Keep your snout to the spout where Jesus comes out in Christian service through Christian action. This is application. James, the brother of Jesus, writes these words. I used to have them posted on the door of the last church I had, right above the door as you left. Do not just listen to God's Word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are fooling yourselves. Amen. You know what? We just can't sit around on the couch and do nothing, can we? We have to do what God's Word tells us to do. But well, we're not just fooling the world. We're fooling ourselves. Listen to what else James writes. James is the brother of Jesus. You know, I, I listened to this pastor, and he's so cool, but some churches wouldn't appreciate it because, you know, how great would it be to be Jesus' brother? Mom says, hey, James, go to well. We need water. Send Jesus. <laughs> you don't get that. You might want to look at the first mirror when Jesus said it perform. Right. I mean, how cool would it be to be Jesus' brother? Now, you've got to realize something. Jesus' family denied Jesus until he was dead and rose again. And then his brothers... We're all in. Deep in my heart. What good is it, brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Mm. Can that kind of faith save anyone? Mm. No. Now that scares me, because that means if I'm not doing anything, am I saved? If you're not doing anything, are you saved? Can it save me? Can it save you? Can it save anybody else if we have the kind of faith that does nothing? 
He says, suppose a brother or sister comes to you who has no food and clothes. And you say, goodbye. Have a good day. You stay warm and you eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. He says, what good does that do? You see, faith by itself is not enough. Unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and it is useless. Think what James is saying is information alone will not produce any transformation at all. The transformation comes from the application. Information will not produce transformation. Application produces transformation. And according to Scripture, these are not my words. I hope they don't... Well, I don't care if they offend anybody or not, because they're God's words. If there is no transformation, there is no salvation, Christian service through Christian action is the application which produces transformation, and transformation is the evidence of salvation. Keep your spout, keep your snout to the spout where Jesus comes out in Christian fellowship. And I cannot express this enough. This is association. Association with like-minded people. It doesn't mean we don't talk to sinners, because if we stay in a group of Christians, we aren't affecting the world. But we need to stay with Christians because we need accountability and to encourage others and to be encouraged ourselves. Luke, this great physician, writes in Acts 2.42, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, all sharing in, in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. The author of Hebrews reminds us, I said it last week, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing new. In the Gospel of Luke, the physician's first letter, he writes in the fourth chapter, he, he meaning Jesus, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. Let me ask you a question. If it was Jesus' custom to go to church every week, Shouldn't it be our custom to go to church every week? I mean, Jesus was God, and he went to church. I want you to know this. If you follow this form of prayer and worship, reading and studying and meditating on God's Word, applying God's Word through service and action, associating with other Christians for encouragement and accountability, you will not be perfect. I promise you that. But you will have less of a tendency to quench, to stifle, to extinguish, and, and to extinguish and to put out the fire, the supernatural fire and the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. I promise you that. If you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the Holy Spirit living in you and you have access to all the power of God. But most of us don't have that power. We have access to it, but we don't have it. You may have some of his power, but you don't have the full superpower of God. So here's the question I want to ask this morning. And the question is not, how much of the Holy Spirit do we have? But how much of us does the Holy Spirit have? Mm -hmm. That's it. Ooh. See, God isn't looking to redirect our lives. He's not trying to take us down a different path. He says... I'm not looking to redirect your life and your will. I want you to surrender your life and your will to my life and to your will. See, it's not redirection. It's full surrender to the one. Listen to this. We're not surrendering to just anybody. We are surrendering to the one who has already won the victory. Hallelujah. He says, quit fighting. Quit trying to do it on your own. Stand firm. You don't have to surrender to the spirit of evil. Surrender to the spirit of God. Amen. The spirit-filled life is going to surrender, yielding your control and letting God have control. And here is what I know. I've seen it in my life. The more we allow God to work in us, the more we see the evidence of God's working power through us and within us. Walk by faith, but live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And here's what I know about you. Here's what I know about me. And some of you say, how can you know anything about me? You don't even know me. 
I know this much about each one of us. You will have as much of the Holy Spirit as you make up your mind. To. You will not have any more, and you will not have any less. You will have as much of the Holy Spirit as you want to have. The Holy Spirit will become as important to you as you allow Him to be. Because here's the thing. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. The Holy Spirit will not force Himself upon you. The Holy Spirit is going to sit back quietly. And He's going to wait for you to give Him control. And folks, this is why I preach like I do. I don't want you to miss the very best that God has for your life. Amen. Amen. And I don't want to miss it for me either. <laughs> we can't do it on our own. No kidding. But the Holy Spirit in us can do it, and He can do what we can't do. Mm -hmm. I cannot fly. But if I get in an airplane, and that airplane takes off, and I'm in it, I am flying. When I put on the clothes of Christ, when I put on the full armor of God, and I have His power, I may not be able to do it, but I'm clothed in Jesus, and Jesus can do it, and therefore I can do it. Amen. Folks, there's two kinds of people. Those of God and those of men. Think about this. Which one will you be? See, God calls each one of us into a ministry that's bigger than any of us. Bigger than any of us call. And none of us can do it on our own. The Holy pure purpose. Hey, here's the thing. A life without purpose is a life that's no good. The Holy Spirit will give you purpose. It will give you the purpose to be the hands and feet of Christ. The Holy Spirit gives you the power and the purpose to be the church to the world. The Holy Spirit says you are the body of Christ. We are the tools God uses to bring the message to a lost and dying world, to our friends and our families who will die and go to hell if we don't do something about it. And we can't do it on our own. The scriptures remind us of that. We need the power and the Spirit of God to do what we cannot do. So for three weeks, we've been asking God to empower us. The question is, do you really want that? I mean, do you really mean that? Do you really desire to live this Christian life and have the power of God? Because if you do, the Holy Spirit will give you the power to do what you cannot do on your own. I want you to be reminded of this. If you are a Christian, you are a warrior, but you are not a warrior against flesh and blood. You are a warrior against the evil things. You are a warrior against the devil. You are a warrior against supernatural powers. But you are clothed in Jesus Christ. And there ain't a demon in hell that can defeat you. Amen. You put on the clothes of Jesus Christ, you put on the full armor of God, and you receive His supernatural power and get into the battle. Jesus is the original, authentic superhero. Amen. 1 John 5, 4. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve victory through our faith. The good news is, we don't have to fight. We don't have to take the hill. All we have to do is stand firm. Satan and all of his forces have already been beaten. They've been disarmed and defeated. There's no reason for any believer to fear the enemy. He has no direct authority over anyone who has put their trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As I said earlier, you have the Holy Spirit power in you. You cannot be defeated. You can't be defeated by the devil. You can't be defeated by his wars, by his authorities, or by his evil spirits. They can harass you, and they will. They can come up against you, and they will. They can frustrate you, you know, but they cannot defeat you. The spirit who lives in you is greater than the one who lives in the world. Amen. Amen. You can be filled with the spirit of the world, or you can be filled with the spirit of God, but you cannot be filled with both. And the good news is, 
God gives you the free will to decide which one you'll be filled with. Book of Romans, chapter 8, beginning with the last half of verse 15. The Apostle Paul says, You have received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. You know what that means? You put your faith and trust in Jesus, then you are a child of God, and by His Spirit, we were heirs of God, we're co-heirs with Christ, and every single thing God gave His Son, Jesus Christ, belongs to you. Amen. You say, I don't feel like a child of God. I don't feel like I can live the Christian life. Let me tell you something. If you're in Christ and the Holy Spirit in you, you are a son or a daughter of God and you can live the Christ-filled life. You say, I've done too much. I don't feel like that I can ever be pleasing and perfect to God. I don't feel Christ-like. If you're in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you, you're pleasing and perfect to God. You're Christ-like to God. You say, God, I can't follow this command to love one another. Man, I have a hard time loving those who love me. I can't love my enemy. Right. If you're in Christ and the Holy Spirit is you, you can love one another. You can even love your enemies. Jesus, nailed to a cross, hanging in the air, pushing himself up to breathe, said, Lord, please forgive them. They know not what they do. And we say, well, that's Jesus. I can't do that. And God says, the same Spirit who lives in Christ lives in you. You can do that. You say, I don't feel like I have any power. If you're in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you, you have power and you have supernatural superpower. You say, I don't feel like I have purpose. My life cannot glorify God. If you're in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you, you have purpose and your life will glorify God. You know, I can't fly. I've tried. I've failed. Even with this Superman costume on, I can't fly. But a plane flies. I get in that plane and it takes off and I'm flying. Clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. I cannot live the Christian life. You cannot live the Christian life. But when you put on the full armor of God, when I put on God's superhero suit, when I put on the clothes of Christ, the Holy Spirit gives me the power to live the Christian life. I'm in Christ. Christ is doing it. Therefore, I'm doing it. The Holy Spirit gives me the power to stand firm against the devil. He gives me the power to stand firm against his wars. He gives me power to stand against the authorities of the dark world and against the spiritual fellow. Uh, forces of the, hell, the heavenly realms and his word says he'll do the same thing for you if you let you will only have as much power of the Holy Spirit as you want to have how much of this power do you truly desire I'm going to close by praying the same prayer that Paul prayed for the Ephesians in chapter 3. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, I fall to my knees and pray to God, the Father, the Creator of everything in heaven and earth. I pray that from His glorious and unlimited resources, He will empower each one of us with the inner strength through His Spirit. And then Christ will make His home in our hearts as we trust Him. Our roots will grow down into God's love and keep us strong. And may we have the power to understand, as all of God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is for us. May we experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. 
Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Amen. 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 Father's Day is known in the church as one of the smallest days of attendance. We've sort of proven that today. Mother's Day is one of the largest. Always take your mom to church. Always go fishing with your dad. But I do want to leave you with this. We had a great tragedy in Orlando at Mayville. Huge massacre. They were interviewing one of the survivors, and the fire said, you know, and I'm not one to question, but this is what he said. He said, this is why everybody needs a relationship with God. And he said, there are 50 people who went out tonight to have a good time, and they thought they would have a good time, go to bed, and wake up as usual. They will never wake up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If any of you desire know, to know more about this Jesus Christ that I've been talking about, and how to have his power, I'm going to go in the back and change, and I'll be in the front room, and I would love to talk. We'd love to invite you to come back next week, bring some family, some friends. It's hard to invite people to church, I know that, but it's never hard to invite somebody to a barbecue. I have no clue, but if you like surprises, which I don't, if you like surprises, might be a good time to come back next week. Fully youth-led service, and because we got teenagers, there will be plenty of food, because I know how to eat. <laughs> Same about you. We invite you to come back and join us. If you want to know more about this power of the Holy Spirit, we meet on Wednesday nights. It has been a fantastic. In fact, our Wednesday night service is growing faster than our Sunday morning service. But we're going to have a meal right after the service next week, and I hope to see you and your family and friends there, and let's fellowship and break bread together as God's Word tells us to do. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. May the blessings of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be among you and within you.